Hey YouTube, how's it going? Mike the Manic Geek here. And today I'm here to take a look at the Bitphoenix Aegis. This is their uh, new micro ATX chassis that they've released, which they claim is where style meets performance. Or maybe it's the other way around. Not entirely sure. But we're here to find out today if the place where style meets performance is also the place where you have to compromise too much on functionality and ease of building. So we're gonna take a look at the outards, move over to the innards, and then I'll give you guys my take on what it was like to put some hardware inside this case. So starting with the front of the chassis here, we can see that uh, from the front and the top, the entire thing is covered with this uh, glossy plastic with the front face being largely flat black. Uh, it is a bit of a dust magnet and a finger fingerprint magnet, so you may wanna make sure you have a decent microfiber cloth on hand to keep this clean. And really the only defining feature of the front of the case here is dependent on the version you get. There is the standard Aegis, which comes with the Bitphoenix icon display that sits in the front, which is a two and a half, uh, 2.8 inch, I'm sorry, uh, LCD display that allows you to customize what the front badging on your case looks like. There is also the Aegis Core, which eschews that screen entirely in favor of a more traditional BitPhoenix logo like what you would see on the rest of their case lineup. Uh, the top of the case has your typical I.O. of two USB 3.0 ports, audio and micro, uh, headphone jacks, uh, you get your power reset switch. You also get a three speed fan speed controller that allows you to control up to four three pin fans inside your case. More on that later. The top of the case is also dust filtered along with the front of the case. Um, actually pretty much every outlet or inlet in this case is filtered except for the rear fan with the top filtering being removed in a similar fashion to something like a Corsair Graphite 600T and that it just sort of latches into place. It's not directly centered over the fans that'll sit up there, but it still offers more than enough room for air to either get out or come into the case depending on your fan configuration. As we move along to the back, we see your typical motherboard I.O. cutout, but we see five PCI Express cutouts. This is awesome to maximize usability of your particular micro ATX motherboard layout in the event that your slots are positioned a bit differently from others, or in the event that you're using some kind of triple slot graphics card solution and still want to have room at the bottom to use another peripheral. Uh, we do have a bottom mounted power supply here, and we also have room for a rear mounted 120 millimeter fan, which in this case is the only fan that the case comes with. I would have liked to see at least one more fan come with it to maximize out of the box cooling potential, but at the very least they do allow you to reposition the fan to two different locations to maximize where it is your air is going to be flowing out of and more importantly into the case. Once we get to the inside, we see a pretty Pretty modular interior with room for up to four three and a half inch drives and two, four two and a half inch drives but no optical drives as you may have seen from the clips of the front of the case uh, really the only thing this is going to limit most modern users with is things like um, bay mounted reservoir and pump combinations fan speed controllers LED controllers things like that um, but the front drive cages as we can see right here are removable and modular when we get to the bottom of the case, we also see that there's a nice bit of flexibility here, not just for the three and a half inch drive cage that's down here, but also for the power supply cover, which is of course removable. Uh, it does brandish a really nice looking Bit Phoenix logo, which thankfully for uh, someone like a case modder is raised. So masking that area off to custom color the Bit Phoenix logo is gonna be really easy. And of course, because it's removable, you don't have to use it. So if you have a power supply that looks good with the rest of your gear, you can show it off if you want to. Now, as far as the things that come with the case, uh, you get your typical baggy o baggy o screws, uh, you get your hard drive slide rails, um, and you get a pretty decent instruction manual. It's well illustrated and well written out. Um, but the main things they come with this case that sort of set it apart accessory wise are the water cooling brackets that it comes with. So you get a 240 millimeter oriented uh, reservoir bracket and this is for mounting tube reservoirs on the inside of your case. You can either mount this to the top of the case or the front of the case or you can mount it to the front 
of a 240 millimeter radiator since the hole spacing on the ends of the bracket matches up perfectly with the hole spacing on these rads. Just make sure that the screws you're using to fasten it are the correct shank length. Otherwise, it's not gonna thread in properly and you run the risk of having your reservoir just sort of drop out and your system blow up. Not literally blow up, but you get the idea. We also see included in this case a, a separate pump mounting bracket. Now this does have a vibration damping foam on the bracket itself to make sure that if your pump's a little on the noisy side, some of that uh, vibration sound is, uh, is quieted up a bit. Now you can also mount this on the top of the three and a half inch drive cage that mounts on the bottom as well as directly to the floor of the case. So you get maximum flexibility with how you want to position this based on your individual storage needs. Now looking on the interior again, we can also see that there is enough that there is an accommodation for a two and a half inch mounting position that sort of extends off of the motherboard tray. Something sort of similar to what Corsair does in some of their newer cases with having the solid state drives display outward so you can actually admire that pretty piece of hardware. But now let's get into actually throwing hardware into the case. So I've got some hardware in here now. It wasn't exactly new hardware and it's not exactly a working system. But this is what I have to work with right now, guys. Bear with me. I promise I'm going to be getting good hardware to put in these in the future. So, building in the case. First of all, let me start with cable management. Cable management actually surprised me a lot with this case. Normally when I build in a BitPhoenix chassis, I expect there to be some sort of unnecessary compromise that's been taken on the amount of space that's available for managing your cables or a complete lack of space entirely in the case of some of their, uh, some of their lower tier case models. But that's not, really, that's not really what happened here. What happened here is someone methodically and carefully thought out where your cables are gonna need to run for most uh, PC configurations that'll get built in here. And there is exactly the right amount of indentation on the motherboard tray, along with the exact right amount of space between the side panel and the tray, so that you should be able to comfortably mount all of the cables you could possibly need for a dual GPU system, be it AMD or Nvidia, along with anywhere from two to four hard drives minimum in this case, with no problems whatsoever getting the side panel back on. Now part of that cable management comes with uh, an interesting little uh, trick that I found with managing the cables here. Your fan speed controller on the top has a connected ribbon of uh, four, four uh, insulated cable sets that join up with the four fans that you control. Well, the front of the case is capable of holding up to 240 millimeter fans or 320 millimeter fans, so you can hold up to a 360 rad or a 280 rad in the front. Now all of those cables obviously would be sticking out in the open over here if you went to go manage the case cables directly. But because there's enough of a gap in this panel here, and it is in fact dust filtered on the top as well as on the front, uh, you actually get a nice little hidey hole for the cables for the fans up front. All you have to do is pull apart the insulation for three of the four cables for the fan speed controller up here. Be careful doing this, by the way, because if you do it too quickly, you could actually rip open the insulation and expose the cables. Plug all of your fan cables into this fan speed controller up here and just tuck them away in here. It's not gonna interfere with anything. This dust filter being in front of the fans is going to ensure that the cables are never gonna hit the fans or vice versa. It doesn't impede airflow at all. In fact, even as restrictive as this front panel may appear to be, that panel does not really restrict airflow on fans at all, uh, especially with the Bitphoenix Spectre Pros that were supplied for me to review this case with. Um, that's an awesome feature for cable management. Uh, and in general, the cables just tidy up really nicely. Just make sure you're not using cable extensions with this. Or if you do use extensions, use extremely short extensions. Like I'm talking maybe four to six inches long at most. Because while there is enough room for you to manage cables 
that just come with the power supply, adding any extra length or situational instances of connector girth behind this tr tray is gonna make things a little taxing for you to keep things clean. Now, radiator fitment in here. It's good, but it's a little tricky. The front can house up to, as I said, a 360 millimeter radiator. The roof can hold up to 220 millimeter or 240 millimeter fans, which means that technically you can also house up to a 240 or 280 rad in the roof here. But because of where the fan openings for securing the fans in place are located, it's actually Im nearly impossible, I, I would actually go so far as to say impossible, to mount a 280 rad in the roof with the barbs facing the rear, which in the, in the case of this chassis would have been ideal. Uh, the end tanks just stick out too far. Now you could put the barbs to the front or if it's an all-in-one liquid cooling loop like a Corsair loop or an NZXT loop or something like that, then the end tanks are short enough you might be able to get away with that in the roof. But apart from that, really the only feasible solution that I see for mounting a radiator in the roof is either to use something like Swiftex H220 or 240X all-in-one liquid cooling kits with uh, short end tanks on the radiators or to mount the barbs near the front. Now mounting them near the front is also going to create some problems for you because with front mounted radiators, there's also really not enough room to have the barbs, uh, the, the end tanks with the barbs on them, uh, face the bottom because there's just not enough clearance. As it is, I was barely able to fit a Swiftec radiator in here that has the uh, reservoir end tank on it with the end tank at the bottom. Personally, I feel like that's probably the ideal radiator to put in this chassis apart from maybe an alpha cool that's thick enough to have the, uh, the, the end tank uh, uh, barb to drain everything out from. It makes the loop easier to maintain and it maximizes ease of, uh, ease of assembly with the case. But with the barbs at the top for a radiator like that, if you're also mounting a 280 rad in the roof with the barbs facing forward, or even a 240 for that matter, the end tanks are gonna be extremely close to each other. And that's gonna create some really strange tubing bend angles for you that may actually make it extremely difficult or depending on your loop configuration, almost impossible to effectively bleed out all of the air bubbles in the loop. So just bear that in mind when you're mounting radiators in here. There is good compatibility here, but my personal recommendation for maximizing cooling efficiency and radiator mounting in here would be to hold a 360 in the front with a 240 in the roof with the barbs facing the rear of the case. That way you get nice even tubing runs going, whether it's softer acrylic tubing or, or PETG tubing. You get to maximize the amount of space with which to mount a reservoir and hopefully a pump. Here's the other caveat that comes with the pump mounting bracket that comes with the case. You can see right here that I have a, what is representative of a full length graphics card. And I'll go ahead and show you guys a close up here in a second with an actual full length graphics card. If you have a full length card on a micro ATX board in this chassis, you're gonna find that it's hanging directly over the bracket that you would mount on top of your three and a half inch uh, hard drive cage so again, you're gonna, be, you're gonna be dealing with really unique fitment scenarios for your pump and it might be difficult, nay impossible, for you to get the right combination of pump orientation and fitting allotment to get everything not just working correctly, but also looking good. I mean, this case has a gloriously large side panel window for you to look on the inside and admire all the hard work you put into the system. Why would you wanna do a botch job of anything like cable management or tubing runs at this point? My personal recommendation, if you're going to water cool more than one card in the system, make it an ITX themed card. So something like the ITX GTX 970s or even R9285s, or even better, go with AMD's Fury lineup. 
The Fury X and Fury are short PCB graphics cards that are capable of pretty respectable 4K uh, gaming uh, chops. Maybe not as strong as the 980 Ti in as many scenarios as an AMD enthusiast would like to see, but the length of the PCB makes it so that you can have two of those cards in the system with the pump mounted right here on top of these three and a half inch drive bays so that even if you were something like a prosumer that does, oh, I don't know, say video editing, you can still have your GPU processing chops all the way you want it, all water cooled, all running super quiet, and still have your pump oriented in the most convenient place possible as well as having enough dedicated storage that you can actually keep all of your information locally as well as on backup drives, either in a cloud server or elsewhere. Probably the only bit about the interior that I have any sort of gripe on is with the other two and a half inch drive mount locations. There's one behind the power supply and there's one that extends out from the motherboard tray. Those, those two and a half inch drive mounts uh, place a lot of strain on your SATA power cables when they're plugged into the hard drive. It's, it's not a huge deal, but it's worrying enough that I have to plug the power cable in first, then bend it pretty significantly in order to even sort of comfortably get the drives in place. As far as the displayed location, that's an easy fix, Bit Phoenix. Move it up about, I'd say, half an inch. That'll enable right angle SATA power connectors, which are the most common on power supplies, as well as right angle SATA data connectors to evenly and cleanly flow off of your two and a half inch drive and hook up with your power supply and your motherboard without putting undue stress on the hard drive because solid state drives are still kind of out of reach for a lot of uh, more price conscientious builders. And they wanna make sure that even if, they, even if they do have the money to shell out on you know, all of the best solid state drives out there, they wanna make sure that they're not damaging their hardware because I don't know about you, but wiping my butt with money is not comfortable in any way. Now, as far as the mount behind the power supply is concerned, that one's probably a little more difficult to address. You would have to have it sticking out a little bit further from the power supply. Uh, but in general, it's still not a bad implementation. The dampers on the bracket back here do raise it up enough that there's not as much tension here as there is on the one in the front, but it's just something you're gonna wanna keep in mind moving forward. So let's get back to the core of the matter. Is this a good case to build in? In my opinion, absolutely. This definitely gets two thumbs up from me. Uh, yes, there's some compromises to be made, but anytime you're moving closer to high performance, there's always going to be sacrifices that are made in terms of practicality and functionality. And I feel that the BitPhoenix Aegis did an excellent job of managing that balance. Um, it's not particularly difficult to build in. It's, it shows really well. It's conservatively aggressive. It's sort of like, it's sort of like a Honda fan that kind of grew up and finally realized that putting a gargantuan lip spoiler on your car and an exhaust does not make it fast or furious in the least. So yeah, that pretty much covers it, guys. Uh, the BitPhoenix Aegis Micro ATX chassis. Let me guys know what you think about it in the comments down below. I personally really, really, really want to get an X99 Gaming built, uh, built up in this. Uh, this is probably the most interesting Micro ATX chassis that I pers personally have seen in some time that makes the right compromises in the right places to maximize your PC building experience, be you an air cooler or a liquid cooler, uh, be you a prosumer or a gamer, be you a whatever kind of builder you are, this case will suit your needs. So guys, uh, do that thumbs up, thumbs down, and share, subscribe thing like you do, how you do. Uh, again, leave me some comments down below. What'd you think about the video? What do you think about this case? Um, what are some build ideas maybe you guys had for a Micro ATX build now that you might not have thought about before uh, since seeing this case? Um, 
Yeah, and until next time, don't forget to check me out on Twitter and YouTube. I got my links to those down in the video description below, and I'll catch you guys next time. Take it easy, YouTube.